Many of the Bible's creation passages involve sea monsters. The reasons why might surprise you. Most Christians are familiar with Genesis 1 and the seven-day creation narrative. What many of them don't know about is all the other creation passages throughout the Old Testament, in Psalms, Proverbs, Job, and elsewhere, that describe creation in a very different way, using themes and motifs that go back to the rituals of pre-exilic Judah, and perhaps even earlier. These stories are about Yahweh and his victory over the sea dragon, Leviathan. This monster is not a snake, a crocodile, a plesiosaur, or a kaiju. It is a mythological creature with important connections to the early religion of Israel and its neighbors. But what are its origins, and what does it have to do with creation? The civilizations of ancient Mesopotamia, Egypt, and pre-classical Greece did not share our modern understanding of the cosmos. They believed the Earth to be a flat disk surrounded on all sides by a great ocean that was sometimes called the river. The sky above was regarded as a solid roof made of stone or metal, the so-called firmament, sometimes imagined to be supported by mountains at the fringes of the world. The ancients knew nothing of the vacuum of space, and instead imagined that a cosmic ocean extended both above the vault of the sky and deep beneath the earth. The celestial ocean in particular was thought to be responsible for rain and the sky's blue color. Although the details varied, this overall view of the world was nearly ubiquitous. We even have an ancient Babylonian diagram of the flat earth, as well as various Egyptian depictions. It's only natural that the ancient Israelites inherited the same understanding of the cosmos. We see this reflected in passages like Psalm 148, which mentions water above the heavenly firmament. Praise Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all you shining stars. Praise Him, highest heavens, and waters above the heavens. Genesis 1 also describes water remaining above the sky when the firmament is created. And God made the firmament and divided between the water which is under the firmament and the water which is above the firmament. And God called the firmament sky. Similarly, Exodus 20 verse 4 is one of many verses mentioning the water below the earth. You shall not make for yourself an idol or an image of anything that is in heaven above, or on earth below, or in the water under the earth. Although textbooks often have illustrations that depict ancient cosmology, no single diagram can perfectly capture how the ancients conceived of the cosmos. The people of Mesopotamia, the Levant, and Egypt described their world through complex myths and symbols. For example, this art from ancient Susa depicts the upper and lower oceans as horned serpents. Below the upper ocean are the gods, possibly equated with the stars in the constellations. Next is the earth, inhabited by humans, animals, and plants. Below that is the citadel of the netherworld, with towers that hold up the world. Every inch is dripping with mythical symbolism. And as we see here, Sea serpents are regarded as an important element of the cosmos. It is clear from ancient literature and iconography that sea serpents played a fundamental role in how the ancients understood creation and the cosmic order. A mythical aquatic dragon is mentioned numerous times in the poetic and ritual books of the Old Testament. It typically goes by three names, Leviathan, Rahab, and Tannin, with the last one often translated as dragon in English Bibles. An example can be found in Psalm 74. But you, O God, are my king from old, doing victorious things in the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons on the water. You shattered the heads of Leviathan. You gave him to the people of the wild beasts as food. Yours is the day, yours also the night. You have established the moon and the sun. You have fixed all the boundaries of the earth. You did create summer and winter. This passage describes the creation of the world by Yahweh, starting with the dividing of the primordial sea to create the earth and sky. And his defeat of Leviathan has a prominent role here. 
taking precedence even over the creation of the moon and sun and the seasons. A similar creation hymn with references to the chaotic sea and a dragon is found in Psalm 89. You rule the surging of the sea. When its waves rise, you still them. You did crush Rahab with a mortal blow. You did scatter your enemies with your mighty arm. Yours are the heavens, yours also is the earth. You have founded the world and all that is in it. Although the dragon is named Rahab here, scholars recognize it as equivalent to the Leviathan of Psalm 74. Up until modern times, the mythological background of this dragon was poorly understood. However, in 1876, a Babylonian creation story known as the Enuma Elish, recovered from the ruins of ancient Nineveh, was published. It describes the creation of the world by the god Marduk through the vanquishing of the primordial waters, personified as the monstrous sea goddess Tiamat. In this story, Tiamat's body is split in two to create the ground and the firmament that holds back the celestial waters. In 1895, German scholar Hermann Gunkel published a highly influential study proposing that the Enuma Elish and the Hebrew Bible both utilized a shared motif known as Kauskampf, in which creation takes place through combat between agents of chaos and divine representatives of order. Even better parallels came to light from 1929 onwards, as the religious tablets of Ugarit, a Bronze Age kingdom not far from Israel, were discovered and published. Some of these texts recount the victory of Baal over the sea god Yam, and a dragon referred to as Lotan and Tunan, names that are equivalent to the Hebrew Leviathan and Tannin. In a widely cited 1985 book, Old Testament scholar John Day made the definitive case that the biblical theme of Yahweh's conquest over Leviathan was primarily Canaanite in origin and not Babylonian. One piece of the puzzle is the story of Baal's defeat of the sea god Yom. It survives only in fragments, but it goes like this. Baal the storm god and Yom the sea god are both vying for kingship of the gods. Yom gets the upper hand at first, but then the craftsman god, Kothar and Hasis, procures two magical clubs for Baal. The first one fails, but the second one hits its target. The club swooped from Baal's hand like an eagle from his fingers. It struck the crown of Prince Yom between the eyes of Judge River. Yom collapsed, he fell to the earth, his joints quivered and his form crumpled. Baal dragged out Yom and put him down. He made an end of Judge Nahar. The goddess Astarte then declares Baal the victor. Yom is indeed dead, Baal shall be king. Although the topic of this story is kingship rather than creation, there are clear links with biblical creation passages. For example, Yom, meaning sea, is personified as a name in the aforementioned Psalm 74. By your strength you divided Yom, you broke the heads of the sea serpents in the waters. And just as Yom is called Judge River in the Ugaritic text, the Bible often depicts the rivers, along with the sea, as the vanquished foes of Yahweh. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry, and he dries up all the rivers. Is your wrath against the rivers, O Yahweh? Is your anger against the rivers, or your indignation against the sea? When you ride upon your horses, upon your chariots of victory, you trample the sea with your horses, the seething mass of mighty waters. Unfortunately, the full description of Baal's fight against the dragon is lost to us. However, we know such a tale existed, because references to it survive among the tablets excavated at Ugarit. In one such text, Mot, the god of death, recounts this fight to Baal. Because you smote Leviathan, the twisting serpent, and made an end of the crooked serpent, the tyrant with seven heads, the skies will become hot and will shine. The war goddess Anat was also a participant in this battle. For in another text, she says, What enemy rises up against Baal? What foe against the rider of the clouds? Have I not smitten Yam, the darling of El? Have I not made an end to River, the great god? Have I not muzzled the dragon, captured him? I did crush the crooked serpent, the tyrant with seven heads. Another fragmentary text describes the Canaanite god Reshef as a participant in Baal's battle against the dragon. Baal smote the dragon and rejoiced and poured out something on the earth. The archer Reshef shot his kidneys and his heart. 
Reshef is also portrayed as part of Yahweh's entourage in the aforementioned Habakkuk 3. God's glory covered the heavens and the earth was full of his praise. The brightness was like the sun, rays came forth from his hand where his power lay hidden. Before him went Deber and Reshef followed close behind. A distinctive feature of the Ugaritic dragon Lotan is that it has seven heads. This is reflected in Psalm 7414, which refers to the heads, plural, of Leviathan. Although the Old Testament does not specify how many heads Leviathan had, the myth of the seven-headed dragon was still known to the authors of later Jewish and Christian literature, like the Book of Revelation, the Odes of Solomon, and the Pistis Sophia. Baal Hadad was the Northwest Semitic storm god, and in the Ugaritic texts as well as visual depictions, he uses lightning bolts as spears. One text describes his weapons as seven lightnings, eight storehouses of thunder, and his spear as a shaft of lightning. A stela depicting Baal holding a lightning spear was even found at Ugarit and can now be seen at the Louvre. In the Bible, Yahweh is also described using storm god imagery since he effectively took Baal's place in Israelite religion. Like Baal, Yahweh's armament includes the use of lightning spears or arrows in several of the passages associated with creation and the Chaos Kampf motif. This seems to be what Psalm 104, a creation psalm we'll examine shortly, is referring to. You make the wind your messengers, fire and flame your ministers. Similarly, Psalm 18 is full of thunder and lightning imagery along with allusions to the primordial sea in its description of Yahweh going into combat. Yahweh also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, and he sent out his arrows and scattered them. He flashed forth lightnings and routed them. Then the channels of the sea were seen, and the foundations of the world were laid bare. Habakkuk 3.11 describes Yahweh as having glowing arrows and a flashing spear, and verse 9 mentions seven arrows, depending on how the Hebrew is translated. Utterly laid bare are your bow and seven arrows with a word. Job 37 describes the voice of Yahweh as thunder that lets loose his lightning to the corners of the earth. Another interesting parallel is found in Psalm 29, which mentions the voice of Yahweh exactly seven times, implying seven thunderbolts as his weapons. The psalm then declares Yahweh's kingship using similar wording to the same Baal tablet. Baal sits enthroned like the sitting of a mountain, Hadad the shepherd like the flood, in the midst of his mountain, the god of Zaphon in the midst of the mountain of victory. Yahweh sits enthroned over the flood. Yahweh sits enthroned as king forever. Yet another text portraying lightning as God's weapon is Psalm 77. When the waters saw you, O God, when the waters saw you, they were afraid. Yea, the deep trembled. The clouds poured out water. The skies gave forth thunder. Your arrows flashed on every side. Historians agree that the Canaanite myth of the storm deity's conflict with the sea predates the Babylonian creation myth about Marduk and Tiamat. According to a study by Paul Alain Beaulieu, this myth originated in the Levant and is first attested in a tablet from Mari that describes the storm god Adad fighting the sea. Take this cylinder seal from ancient Mari, for example. It shows the high god Anu, or El, seated on his divine mountain. The primeval flood gushes out of the mountain and the storm god Adad on the left combats the water with his spear. This motif probably spread to Mesopotamia during Babylon's first dynasty, which was ruled by Amorite kings, including the famous Hammurabi, rather than local Akkadian kings. Thus, contrary to Gungol's theory, the Israelite creation myth was not based on the Babylonian myth, but was arguably more original. There was a seven-headed hydra that appeared briefly in earlier Akkadian art in Eshnuna, but it's not clear what, if any, connection it had to the later sea serpent combat myth. Why does the storm god take center stage in these myths? According to Bernard Bato, the god who controlled the winds and rain was vitally important to the agriculture of the Levant, where no rain fell for half the year. Fertility, drought, and floods were under his control, and through various societal shifts too complex to describe here, the Syrian storm god Adad 
known as Baal Hadad or simply Baal at Ugarit and in the Bible, became the most prominent deity of the Near East, and Syria in particular, during the Bronze Age. During the Middle Bronze Age, circa 2000 BCE, we also see the emergence of iconography in Anatolia and Syria showing the storm god in conflict with a serpent while holding a spear of lightning. The Hittites had developed their own myth about the storm god Taru fighting a dragon that lived underground. Recited at the Spring Festival, this myth illustrated the cycle of the seasons, with the serpent representing the dry months and the storm god's final victory representing the coming of spring. The king is regarded as the son of the storm god, and according to Hittite scholar Fulkert Haas, his assistance in defeating the serpent provides an etiology for the institution of kingship. In the later version of this myth, the monster becomes a sea serpent. It seems possible then that the Ugaritic myth of Baal fighting both the sea and a sea serpent is connected with both the Syrian and Hittite versions of the storm god combat myth. The Semitic sea dragon myth even seems to have influenced archaic Greece, where we have similar traditions about the sea monster Typhon and the nine-headed sea serpent Hydra, as well as a multi-headed serpent named Ladon, a name probably derived from Lotan, who guarded a sacred tree bearing the fruit of immortality in the Garden of the Hesperides. The intriguing connections here to the Eden story will have to wait for another video. Returning to the Israelites, this theme of Yahweh's combat with Leviathan and the sea was clearly very important, or we wouldn't find it all over the Old Testament. But what did it mean to the Israelites, and why did they understand it as a creation battle? The Ugaritic texts about Baal's conflict with Yom and the dragon do not mention the creation of the world, but they are concerned with Baal's kingship, temple building, and the ordering of chaos. Baal's kingship and his role as a storm god mean that he has ordained the kingdom's social order and the natural cycles of seasons and harvests. This is the kind of creation that mattered to ancient societies, more than the intellectual question of how the world began. According to Danish scholar Jakob Gronbach, creation was originally understood not as a singular event of the distant past, but as an annual regeneration of the cosmos. Every year was a new beginning, a recreation, and according to several scholars, including Day and Gronbach, the creation of the world and Yahweh's enthronement were celebrated every new year, which occurred in autumn during the harvest under the old Canaanite-slash-Israelite calendar. Specifically, the new year was when the original Feast of Tabernacles was held to celebrate the harvest and Yahweh's kingship, and some of the oldest psalms that contain these motifs might have been composed for this festival. Habakkuk 3 also contains musical notation and was undoubtedly sung during that same festival, according to John Day. In the Pentateuch, the oldest references to the Harvest Festival call it Asif, meaning ingathering, or Sukkot, a word that describes temporary huts. According to Deuteronomy 16, this festival was held in Jerusalem over a period of seven days to ensure Yahweh's blessing on the crops. Exodus 23.16 confirms that it took place at the end of the year. According to Leviticus 23, which simply calls it the Festival of Yahweh, fruit, leafy branches, and palm fronds were to be gathered for this festival, though their purpose is not specified. Remarkably, tablets recovered from Bronze Age Ugarit describe an autumnal New Year festival that sounds practically the same. After a seven-day celebration, accompanied by sacrifices performed by the king, temporary huts made of tree branches would be constructed on the roof of the temple as dwellings for the gods. An offering of grapes would also be made to the high god El. We see here a close correspondence to the description in Leviticus of a New Year festival involving fruit and tree branches. In other words, the oldest biblical creation texts we have been examining were probably composed to celebrate the harvest, the New Year, and the original Feast of Tabernacles. Furthermore, these creation stories and the harvest festival both have remarkable precedents in the religious culture of Ugarit many centuries earlier. Although the myth of Yahweh's combat with the dragon was never forgotten, the context of a royal harvest festival in Jerusalem became irrelevant during and after the exile. The Feast of Tabernacles evolved to accommodate new social realities, and so did Jewish creation stories. In many biblical passages, the chaos dragon and the sea become symbols for enemy nations. We see this in Isaiah 37, for example. 
Egypt's help is worthless and empty. Therefore, I have called her the silenced Rahab. Isaiah 51 connects Yahweh's defeat of the sea and Rahab to the exodus from Egypt and the end of the Babylonian exile. Was it not you who hewed Rahab in pieces, who pierced the dragon? Was it not you who dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, who made the depths of the sea a way for the redeemed to pass over? So the ransomed of Yahweh will return and come to Zion with singing. Indeed, the Exodus story itself, in which Yahweh dries up the sea to help the Israelites escape Egypt, is probably derived from the same creation myths. Other texts develop the Kauskampf theme in a more philosophical direction. Take Psalm 104, a wisdom psalm remarkable for its depiction of creation, as well as the presence of Canaanite and possibly Egyptian influence. Although this text is later than some of the others we've looked at, its conceptual model of the cosmos is the same. It describes the heavens as a tent that Yahweh stretches over the earth, implying a physical dome-shaped structure. Yahweh builds his celestial palace on the water that exists above the heavens. He sets the foundations of earth in the deep, Tehom in Hebrew. He rides on the wind in a chariot of clouds, storm god imagery found elsewhere in the Bible, as well as in Ugaritic descriptions of Baal the cloud rider. As a storm deity linked with fertility, Yahweh makes springs gush forth in valleys and streams flow down mountains. He makes the grass, the crops, and the forests grow. He even feeds the wild animals. Lastly, this psalm mentions Leviathan by name, except that here, Leviathan is no longer the monster that God fought at creation. He has become a part of creation itself. Despite the many elements shared with earlier creation psalms, the theology of Psalm 104 has developed in a new direction. Psalm 104 belongs to a genre of writing known as wisdom, and creation was a central topic in wisdom literature. It is no surprise, then, that so many of the Bible's creation passages are found in the wisdom psalms, Proverbs, and Job. Psalm 104 is the penultimate step in the development of the Old Testament's creation theology. The final step is Genesis 1, which appears to be modeled directly after Psalm 104. This dependence is suggested by the striking parallels in both the order of elements and what Jay Levinson calls substantial overlap in vocabulary. That Genesis 1 is dependent on Psalm 104 and not vice versa is likely because of the trend in demythologization that we observe going from the earlier creation psalms to Psalm 104 and other wisdom literature, and finally to Genesis. The idea of primordial combat just barely survives in Psalm 104 verse 7 but is gone in Genesis 1. The Leviathan of Psalm 104 is reduced to taninim, or dragons. The reference to the wind of God hovering over the face of the deep in Genesis 1 recalls Yahweh coming on the wings of the wind in Psalm 104 verse 3. Genesis 1 takes the elements of creation described in Psalm 104, but for the first time depicts creation as a process. Psalm 104 clearly feels like a stepping stone in the transition from creation as a mythical conflict celebrated through ritual, to a wisdom philosophy and finally a one-time quasi-historical event. In summary, Syrian and Hittite myths from the Middle Bronze Age about the storm god Adad, fighting the sea god and a dragon respectively, were combined in the Levant, where they became the basis for national religion and New Year festivals. The Judahite version of these myths survive in some of the oldest psalms. During and after the exile, these creation stories were adapted to wisdom literature and eventually became the basis for the historicized creation process described in Genesis 1. Creation in the Bible is a rich and multifaceted topic that cannot be understood or appreciated simply by fixating on Genesis 1 as so many religious leaders and organizations tend to do. Those who focus on a literal reading of Genesis and ignore all the creation tales that preceded it do their followers a disservice, depriving them of a deeper encounter with the Bible and the ancient Israelite traditions that produced it. We'll be fighting at close quarters with the most tenacious of all sea beasts. The only vital spot is directly between the eyes. 